Written by Brandon Sanderson and released in 2010, three months before the penultimate Wheel of Time book, which he also co-authored, The Way of Kings is the sixth Cosmere book and the first one in the Stormlight Archive. And if you know nothing about Sanderson's works or what the Cosmere is, that's okay. I'm not going to be spoiling anything in this video. I'm going to talk about why I think the opening of the book is kind of inaccessible and why I think there are other factors later on that keep that being the case and then I'm going to talk about why it is I still love the book. Not even in spite of those things but sometimes because of them. Part 1. So what do I mean when I say The Way of Kings is difficult to read? Because it's not like Ulysses or something like that. By all accounts it's probably easier to read than a lot of classic literature. But it is different to say something like Mistborn which I'm going to use to explain just a little bit of context as to what makes the Stormlight Archive a bit more difficult. Now Mistborn is used often as an example of where to start with Sanderson and I tend to agree. In it we get some very Sanderson style things that you'll see in his other books like a very Sanderson style hard as he puts it himself magic system called Allomancy. It's not the only magic system that you're going to see in Mistborn but because of how it's explained it's probably the most relevant to this video. Here is a clip of the Sanderman himself talking about it. I intentionally in Mistborn, um, if you haven't read this book, it starts off um, kind of working to ground you in the world, but the first time that the main character uses the magic, I cut and you don't see that scene. There's a whole ton of world building I'd have to drop on you to explain the magic, and it works so much better if I hold that off until you are more grounded in the actual setting and characters, and then you get it. The scene he's talking about here is the prologue of the final empire, the first Mistborn book, and it does exactly as he says, it doesn't explain the magic system. Instead we learn about things like the environment, the weather, and the caste system that's in this world. We learn that the sun is red, like all the time really red. We learn that for some reason ash falls from the sky and some of it we even see through the eyes of someone who will be a very important main character, Kelsier. All of this gives us a firm hold on our setting and even a little bit on character before we get to the more intangible stuff like magic. We're given the real before we go to the really fantastical. So what does this have to do with the Way of Kings? Well, for the purpose of this video, the introduction that we see in the Final Empire is going to serve as basically complete contrast to how we were introduced to the world of the Stormlight Archive in the Way of Kings. Everything is just kind of thrown at us at once. And I love it. Now in regards to everything being thrown at us at once, Sanderson even says as much in the full lecture that I took a clip from earlier and I'll have that linked in the description below if you'd like to watch it. I would recommend if you're interested in his writing process or really his books at all watching those lectures that he has because that's only one of like 12 or something. So how does Sanderson introduce us to the Stormlight Archive, this epic 10 book series? Well have you ever heard people say that they don't like prologues? Maybe you're even one of those people. People. And that's fair, I understand why they could feel unnecessary or like they bloat books that are already pretty long. Well, The Way of Kings has three of them. Now, if you are a Sanderson fan, specifically someone who likes The Way of Kings, you might be thinking, yeah, three prologues, it's great. But not everyone likes prologues or interludes between parts of the book or epilogues, all of which this has in abundance. So that's already a barrier to entry for probably a lot of readers. Now of these three prologues, first of all we get the prelude to the Stormlight Archive, then we get the prologue, then we get chapter one which by Brandon's own admission is also a prologue. And you know when you read a prologue and then you go into the first chapter and there's a change in like the setting or character or time or all three when you read the first chapter? This happens every time with all three of these prologues. Each of them are separate with different settings, different characters, in totally different times. The first one is set 4,500 years before the second one, which is set five years before the third one, which is set a year before the actual start of the story in chapter two. And not all of the content in these is very self-explanatory. Now just to reiterate, I'm still not going to spoil anything that's in this book or any of the other Cosmere books, but I will talk a very little bit about what's in these prologues. So the prelude, which is the first prologue, shows an ancient event through the eyes of someone who was present for it. And when you start the actual story, it feels 
totally irrelevant to what's going on. Also, none of the characters who you see in that will show up as viewpoint or main characters later on in the book. So you're not even like getting context for their character like Kelsey or in Mistborn. In the second prologue, which thank god is actually called the prologue, we're introduced to the main magic system which we'll see again later in the book. Now this is where Sanderson in his lecture directly contrasts Mistborn and the Way of Kings. In this case we don't get character and world building before we get the magic. In fact we don't actually even get a main character because Zeth, whose viewpoint we're in in this prologue, isn't a main character for the rest of the book. So as soon as we start hearing about the Alethi and the Parshendi and shard bearers and truthless, Zeth just breathes in light from the lamps on the wall and starts running around on the ceiling with a magic sword. We get the magic with characters and world building, none of which we really understand yet, and only some of which will get explained later in the book. Like, it's been 11 years and I still don't know what a truthless is. On the second and third pages of the first chapter, at least that's how it is in my edition, which is back here, we get the word fear spren and we get the word rock bud, and we get no explanation for what these mean. And actually, before I go throwing more words out there, just to recap, this is the first chapter, which is the third prologue. I'll give you a second just to get your notes right. Oh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I was able to come to understand these two terms later on in the book, but there is a difference between saying ash fell from the sky, which is the opening line of Mistborn, where we know what ash is, we know what the sky is, and we know what falling is, as opposed to in the Way of Kings, and I quote, small fear spren like globs of purplish goo began to climb up out of the ground and gather around his feet. Like, what is that? I didn't know if they were creatures or hallucinations or what. These three prologues can feel like a lot, and I know that for me personally, I just kind of had to sit back and read on and hope that it made sense at some stage, which, to be fair, it did. But starting the Way of Kings this way wasn't an accident. It was totally intentional on Brandon's part. Here's another clip of him talking about it from that earlier lecture. I made the decision in that case, instead, to lead with a character using the magic but that increases my learning curve and that increases the likelihood that someone is going to put the book down and get bored early on. That was a risk I was willing to take for that specific story, but it also, also has a cost to it. So it was a calculated risk on Brandon's part to start the book off this way. He knew that some people wouldn't want to go through this steep learning curve, and that's fine. It's not everyone's cup of violet wine. But it's not just the beginning of the book that can create a barrier to entry for new readers. The Way of Kings has a few other quirks that can work against it in this way. Part 2 While all fantasy is by definition set in a world that's different than ours, this is not binary, it's more of a spectrum of difference. Urban fantasy could share many characteristics with a world that we know now, but then with maybe fantastical elements like magic. Epic fantasy generally creates a wholly new world in which to tell its story, but even then it can also be inspired by, for example, a historical period in our world, like medieval Europe, and that makes it that little bit more accessible. The Way of Kings falls more on the far end of the spectrum when it comes to how similar it is to our world. Roshar, which is the name of the continent where the book is set, doesn't resemble even in the slightest any period of human history in any location that I am aware of. This is actually a big reason, and Brandon has talked about this, that the Stormlight Archive would be very difficult to make into any sort of live action TV show or film. That level of difference also adds to the level of abstraction we feel when we're in that world. If you've seen any live action fantasy adaptations like the Lord of the Rings movies, sure, that is a fantasy world with elements that can't exist in real life, but at the same time it also has like grass. Roshar doesn't have grass, at least where 99% of the story takes place doesn't. It's got rock and crabs and rock buds, which are like these little armadillo plants that have tentacles on them. And like I mentioned rock buds earlier, I also mentioned 
Fearspren, which are these little magic spirits that are attracted to fear. And spren of all kinds exist for different emotions and also things that aren't emotion like wind or... Is, is anticipation an emotion? I don't know, but there's a spren for it. In fact, all different kinds of spren are just sort of there at any given time in the book, along with all the other weird elements, including a devastating storm which recharges everyone's light bulbs, which is also their money. So you can see how someone might get through the early parts of the Way of Kings and still not feel like they have a real foothold in the world. It can feel too distant from the world that we know, too other to get into. But again, it's not a mistake on Brandon's part. This is just a matter of taste. It won't work for some people, just like the three prologues won't work. And just like learning a magic system before we even know the color of the sun in the world. Spoilers, I think it's just yellow. It's not red like in Mistborn. And there's only one of them. But there are three moons. So that's something. This isn't an exhaustive list of everything that could take someone out of the world of Roshar. I didn't even touch on the amount of crabs that are in this book, but each of these is an example of somewhere where the Way of Kings could lose someone who picks it up because of decisions made by the author. As Brandon says himself about the prologues, there's a cost associated with writing the books in this way. But if these are the costs, then what are the benefits? Why would he include all of these elements if they could create a steep learning curve that would stop people from reading. I don't claim to have an exact objective answer to this question, obviously, but I can tell you why I love everything that these choices bring to the book. Part 3 So not only do I think that each of the difficult aspects of this book are worth pushing through, I actually particularly like all of them, which, to be fair, isn't terribly surprising since Sanderson is a very successful and talented author and obviously knew that there was an upshot to including them. Still, I just love that in my experience with the series, everything that I've identified as a possible pitfall actually end up being things that I really like. The prologue with Zeth is easy to point to as actually good, even though it does throw all of its information at you at once, because it's fundamental to knowing where all the characters are when the book starts, and it's an event that colours every everything that happens after it for many books to come. But something like the prelude still mightn't feel relevant even by the time you finish The Way of Kings. The reason that I like it is because it kind of sets a precedent for the Stormlight Archive going forward. In fact, I actually think all of the prologues do something, and I like to think of it like this. Each of the prologues sets up something with varying scopes of relevance. So the last prologue, which is chapter one, is the most relevant to the beginning of the actual story in chapter two, whereas the second prologue with Zeth, which is actually called prologue, is more relevant later in the book, and that scope continues to later books, possibly even to book five, I would say, likely until book five. So the final prologue prepares us for what happens right after it at the start of the actual story, and the second prologue prepares us for the rest of that book, as well as other books to come. That leaves the prelude, the first prologue, which has the largest scope of all. Even titled the prelude to the Stormlight Archive, not the Way of Kings, the prelude to the entire series, I didn't even really understand the significance of what I saw in this scene until probably after I finished Oathbringer and really started to get a handle on the lore. But even though I know how significant what happens in the prelude is now, I still think that the reason it was put in there hasn't come up yet. I think that what we see in that is going to have ramifications into the second half of the books, book 6 to 10. I think that the prologue, which we've seen a lot of already, come up in different books, you'll know if you've read them, is important, and that it has had a lot of relevance. I still think that's going to be very relevant in the fifth book, and maybe not so much after that. The prelude is the prelude to the whole series. I really think that we're going to see why that was put in there in the second half of the books. I love that there's even something at the very start of the first book that still is relevant and will be relevant going into the second half. Now some of that is speculation, so if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Still, I really like it. <laughs> Apologies if the lighting just like changed. I'm not sure how this is going to look like in the edit, but my battery ran out and so I thought I'd go make a tea.
I could say more about these prologues. Like, to clarify, I don't just think the prelude will only be enjoyable in the second half. I still think that it provides interesting historical context for characters who are mentioned in the Way of Kings, the Heralds. But it did take me a while to kind of realise that myself. There's a lot of lore in these books, including two separate, very important historical events where a group of people leave magical swords somewhere and then go away, so it can get confusing. And going back to chapter one, the third prologue, that has relevance in the immediate because of the character stuff that it gives you, but it does also introduce some important world building elements. It just doesn't explain them, like my example of Fearspren earlier. So when I took that as an example, it's like, yeah, you don't get an explanation about it. But as a really important part of Roshar, Spren do get more solidified later, and this is the start of that. So in the context of the whole book, it really works actually. So with something like the Spren, if you do like getting things explained to you, say the first time that they show up, I can see why this wouldn't really work for you as well as it did for me. But I really enjoyed that as I kept reading, things just kind of kept getting thrown at me and some things were explained and some things you just pick up by context. And as I went on, I didn't realize how much of the world I was getting to know until I knew it pretty well. At a certain point, I realized that I had just become like fully suffused with the world of Roshar and I didn't really even notice it happening because as I said, I just kind of sat back, read on and eventually things did make sense. Also, as a small addendum at this point in the video, I will admit that I'm kind of lying a little bit. Not really, but like a, a little bit. Because while I do think that all of these things could add to the barrier for entry, to the learning curve, whatever you want to call it, The Way of Kings is only difficult to read by Sanderson's standards. San... St Standardson's. Like I said earlier, it's not Ulysses, okay? That book is hard to read. Or so I've been told. I haven't read it. Classical literature kind of scares me. I'm even like, I'm a little scared to read The Lord of the Rings because I love the films and I'm kind of concerned that I might get really bored or not be able to follow the books. Sanderson, by contrast, is very utilitarian with his prose, by his own admission even. And though everything I've mentioned does add to that barrier of entry, I still think that it's all around lowered because of how accessible his writing is to begin with. So it kind of balances out, I suppose. I just wanted to address that part of The Way of Kings. Even Brandon's least accessible book is easy to read if you like his style, which I do. Part four. I know this is normally the part of the video essay where, like, someone will try to conclude their arguments, but I'm not really arguing anything here. Some parts of The Way of Kings make it harder to read than some other books, and some parts of it make it easier to read than some other books. This is not a groundbreaking take. I just wanted to talk about how those parts specifically enhance the experience for me personally. This is all just how I feel, it's all emotional. I'm not a critic or a media analyst, I'm just a, a fantasy fan who really likes the Cosmere. And I think that this learning curve has one other benefit in that it prepares you for what's to come. The Stormlight Archive and the Cosmere as a whole are very vast. I think that Mistborn is a good introduction in that it eases you into a world which happens to be part of a bigger universe. But there is definitely something to be said for how the Way of Kings introduces you to it, which is throwing a lot of things at you and just letting you absorb it as you go. If you don't like how the Way of Kings starts, there's a good chance that you won't like digging through vast amounts of information to find connections between seemingly unrelated series that happen to be in the same universe. Not that that's the appeal of the Cosmere and Sanderson for everyone, but it's part of the fun for a lot of people, me included. For me, Stormlight and the Cosmere as a whole are so appealing because it's this vast, complex story which is presented in a writing style, both the actual prose and the structure of the books, which I find quite easy to read. As I said earlier, classic fantasy kind of scares me, so it's nice to know that there's a big story out there that I can always dip back into that's written in a style that I know I enjoy, and it also happens to have a story I'm really interested in and characters who I absolutely love.
thank you so much for watching this video, especially if you've made it this far. Uh, I'm a fan of video essays and books, and I've never really done anything like this before, but it was a lot of fun, so I really appreciate the support. If you did enjoy this video, please feel free to like it and share it and do all that stuff, but what I'd really like is if you told me the aspects of The Way of Kings that you enjoy the most. Not just necessarily like moments in the story or plot beats, though I'd love to hear them as well, but I'd really like to know what makes you connect with it, and if you're someone who didn't like the book or didn't make it all the way through, I'd be interested to know what it was that kept you from getting into it. Again, thank you so much for watching, and if I do make any more videos like this, I'll hopefully see you there.